it's, uh, you know, as a, as a good Russian, or a good Soviet for that matter, I believe that all literature is political, especially in totalitarian society, um, but, which I was not growing up in. I mean, Brezhnev was not totalitarian society, but it was still a, an autocratic one or um, communist one for that matter, whatever, whatever jargon we want to use here. Um, so I do believe that all literature, is, all art is political, especially in places like that, and free places. Uh, and uh, uh, Nabokov came out of that formula. I mean, he did immigrate already um, uh, before the Soviet Union really became what Soviet Union became, and yet he was very much aware of the differences and, and the totalitarian structures and totalitarian formulas. Uh, and uh, he, in, in his art, in his work, claimed that he was not a political writer because it was useless to be a political writer. He was just a, um, um, he was, uh, he was um, just living in an ivory tower of, of his language and, and his stories. Um, and so I argue that it's wrong. I mean, it's not wrong. He can say all he wants, but I'm just explaining why he is a political writer. And every piece of work he ever did was political or sociopolitical. And I think his big project uh, was to rewrite Russian literature that we already mentioned. Uh, we all live in Gogol. We all live in Dostoevsky in a happy key because Russian, Russia is a very unhappy formula for life. I mean, we're killed and imprisoned but our parades are great, so that in itself is a very unhappy formula. So you, you're willing to be killed, uh, so your state would be great. So that actually leaves a human being, an individual, with nothing. Um, and that translates in, in, in the Russian literature as well, because if we look at Gogol's characters or Dostoevsky's characters, it's all misery to death. Um, and so my great belief that Nabokov just rewrote every single piece of great Russian literature in a happy Western key. Sort of he, you know, the only thing you Russians know is to how to suffer. And let me tell you, that's not the way to go. It's really not the way into the future. And I think he was right. And, you know, if we look at his books, um, so Pale Fire, for example, I think was a rewrite of Diary of a Madman and uh, Invitation to a Beheading was a tiny little scene in The Idiot, um, the invitation to, the a beheading that, that Mushkin witnesses. And so Nabokov wrote a novel about this, um, how to get out of, of um, misery and uh, become an individual versus the, versus the crowd. Um, what else? Ada, of course. Ada Ward is a great rewrite of Anna Karenina. In fact, he does it very deliberately, the first line does say that all, unha all happy families are more or less dissimilar, all unhappy families are more or less alike. Do you think it's no, it's, it's actually, it's a great question because I don't see it. It's interesting because I wasn't even, I wasn't even following that. I mean, I did read about it and I immediately forgot about this because unfortunately in the Russian opposition, you know, that's what my original question was, where Andrei Sakharov, who are actually in opposition for, for, uh, for the cause. And I'm not sure that Gary Kasparov is entirely that cause-driven, because I think there's a lot of ego and a lot of personality going on in there. And uh, uh, I could see his point. I could see the point of, I don't know about firing, but I could see the point of, of not believing Medvedev, because I, don't be, I, I thought it was such a great, I mean, something we talked about at the beginning is that he has a great position of being in opposition to the Kremlin, being in the Kremlin himself, which is such a Russian hypothetical formula, but it's also a very artistic formula, something we keep coming back to. It's a great, it's a great mythology. So not that I would trust Medvedev, but also um, uh, we also know from history that, that, uh, that Russia is really great at hijacking um, the opposition message or the alternative message and then de completely devaluing it because you know when Medvedev talks about legal nihilism uh, that Russia is a, uh, cannot be an uh, oil economy anymore and Stalinism was not entirely that great and, and what now what does it mean I mean how show me it in policy and in policy it doesn't translate so I don't believe him and you know that's Stalin also, not that I'm comparing them, but Stalin also was great at saying, you know, the 
class struggle and we are against imperialism, which is all fine. I mean, it's all good. You know, the capitalist exploiters, yes, they do exist. So not that he was entirely incorrect, but the way it worked out for the country, it really was not that that wonderful. So um, I think Russia in many ways is in a bind because not that Medvedev can be trusted as an opposition, but not that the opposition is can be trusted as something that is a um, that could be a viable alternative or even trusted by the people to lead it uh, to lead it ahead because I don't know if I would follow Gary Kasparov. I mean I did go to the, to the meetings uh, and uh, I just don't see where it's going and it doesn't seem I mean it's great that somebody's doing this but it would be great if there would be many more it would be more respectable not that he's is not respectable but sort of more trustworthy figure that leads that leads that that uh, you know Pascal probably would be better better candidate um, so I, 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 I honest, unfortunately I do not have an answer to this question but what really is a disturbing is that it's in ex it's extremes on every in every level on every level on every side of it you know the, the, the authority we cannot trust the authorities but also is it really is it really worth firing your colleague. I mean, it's almost one time I got an email saying, "Who allowed you to work in Nabokov? Your grandfather was a bl bloodthirsty dictator, and he was a great loving, and he was a freedom loving um, author." And I was like, "Well, I'm sorry. And am I supposed to get a permission from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union or anti-communist party of something else?" And so I think that is a tendency in Russia: is that you only see your own your own side and that's something that I'm arguing against. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a better answer for you, I'm sorry. So um, why aren't there any modern Sakharovs? Uh, because we're not dictatorial enough. I think when, when gulags are up and not just Khodorkovsky in them or if you are the people, we will get Sakharovs. I mean that's our problem. We're just in this kind of murky, it's kind of, I called it a gray matter of Putinism. So you believe the further that Putin will go toward authoritarianism, yes. the stronger the opposition The stronger will. the opposition will be, but I don't really know whether he would because he's very smart. And he may, I mean, and that's, I think, kind of worked wonders for him because he was able to give a certain illusion of, I mean, that Medvedev is a great, Medvedev takes up the 20% of, of, uh, of those of us who think Putin is, whole. I mean, I don't believe Medvedev, but some people do. He does look, for me, he's just the first lady that Putin took in um, to uh, kind of give the civil, give it the civilized appearance. So have some cookies. Oh, freedoms are important. Oh, there are the napkins. Stalinism is not that good. And so, so I wouldn't entirely trust that um, that combination. And brings me back to my double eagle. I mean, as, as long as the double eagle is there, we're just doomed, basically, because you, you really have to know where you're going. But once you don't, you end up with this. So I don't, you know, it doesn't seem that, and we kind of fall now, we fall in between the two heads. And, you know, the opposition also has to have a clear message. And things are not horrible enough, so the opposition cannot get strong and they're not leaders and whatnot. So we're really in a, in a horrible situation. So my solution is chop off an eagle. I mean, chop off one head. Doesn't matter which one, just pick a side and stay there. And I also think 11 time zones is really a problem. It's a huge, huge problem. I know they're not gonna give out their territory, but empires are absolutely obsolete in the modern era. They can take care of themselves. Russia cannot take care of itself. And um, so it's going to come and bite us very, I mean, it is already biting us, but we can pretend that it's okay still. That's going to be a huge, another 50 years, and that it's going to blow up in a horrible manner. So we'll end up being, I don't know, part of Ukraine, something like that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really great place to wrap up. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so uh, much. Extremely fascinating.